Scott Ritter, former Marine officer, former United Nations weapons inspector, a man who knows more about war uh, than almost anybody else on the planet, certainly anybody else that's active in public life trying to warn people of the very real dangers of the situation we are now in. I'm glad to say he's with us now. Uh, Scott, uh, let's talk, if we may, about, first of all, what happened before moving on to what might happen next. If you would describe for us, with your peerless experience, uh, what happened in the uh, Iranian attack on Israel last night? Well, simply put, what happened is that the Iranian government has established a um, publicly um, discernible policy on deterrence. Uh, they have let Israel know, and, and not just Israel, they have let the United States and every other nation in within missile range know that there will be a heavy price to be paid if you attack Iranian soil. Um, that Iran will not tolerate the kind of attack that took place on the 1st of April, where Israel attacked um, the Iranian consulate in Damascus. And I believe Iran is also putting um, a marker on the table that says Iran will no longer tolerate the kind of actions such as the assassination of um, nuclear scientists on its soil by Israel in the past. This will not be tolerated. That in the future, if you choose to attack Iran, Iran will retaliate, and they will retaliate with the kind of force that cannot be interdicted and the kind of force that will destroy that which is seeking to destroy. Now, the Iranians were very clever in, the, in, in creating this posture in that all they had to do was show a proof of concept. I think a lot of people were saying, well, they didn't destroy uh, an airfield. They didn't destroy an Israeli headquarters. They didn't kill hundreds or thousands of Israelis. They weren't intending to. They were simply letting the Israelis and the Americans know that we have the capacity to destroy an airfield. All the Israelis have to do is look at a map, look where the, the, the Iranian missiles hit, and understand that the Iranians hit that which they were aiming at, and there was nothing Israel could do to stop those missiles from reaching their target. And Israel is the most heavily defended airspace in the world, with the most sophisticated anti-missile technology deployed in depth, and they couldn't stop the Iranian missiles. So the signal to the United States, which lacks this uh, comprehensive air defense umbrella over its installations in the Middle East is there too, but for the grace of God go you if you choose to attack us or facilitate an Israeli attack. So this was, I call it one of the, the greatest military demonstrations in modern history because by doing what they did, Iran not only put Israel into check, but believe it or not, they have created a foundation for peace and stability in the Middle East by eliminating uh, from, con of, from consideration options that Israel and the United States may have been considering down the road, such as a preemptive strike against uh, Iranian nuclear facilities or a punishing attack against the Iranian regime. The United States and Israel now on notice that if they attempt to do something like that, the price they will pay will be prohibitively high. In the case of Israel, it might be terminally high. Help those of us who don't know uh, weapons and systems uh, like you do, Scott. Uh, I said uh, earlier in, in my monologue that the very slow-moving drones and then the cruise uh, missiles that were launched, second-grade second grade ones, uh, were to, as it were, draw the anti-missile fire to exhaust it. It's very expensive. It's in rather short supply. Uh, and then to, uh, as a coup de grace, if you like, uh, deliver the ballistic missiles, which cannot be, were not uh, uh, stopped, were not interdicted, were able to uh, land on their target, the air base in the Negev. Uh, have I got that right? And can you help further explain? Certainly. First of all, let's just point out the reality that uh, Iran started this attack um, by launching 
the slowest, loudest weapons in its arsenal, the Shahid drones. And they did that because they were sending a signal to Israel, the United States, and everybody, we're attacking Israel. Now, if they were looking to carry out you know, a lethal attack, why, why announce it five hours in advance? Why give Israel a chance to withdraw its high-valued assets from uh, bases of, uh, that are vulnerable? Um, why give the United States, Great Britain, and France a chance to move resources up, ships, airplanes over Jordan, to intercept these missiles? Iran was saying, here we come, shoot us down. <laughs> and they did. They came out and they shot the, uh, they shot the drones down. Now, Iran launched tens of millions of dollars worth of drones. The United States and Israel spent billions of dollars shooting them down. This is a financial equation that's unsustainable, and that was one of the points that Iran was making, is you can't afford this kind of war. Then they sent in cruise missiles that, combined with the drones, defined the initial phase of the air defense uh, reaction. Not only the air defense, the outer, the, uh, the airplanes, but once they penetrated the airplanes, the Iron Dome started engaging. And they brought in missiles at a higher level so that the aero systems and the Patriots started to engage. And they defined the radar. They defined how Israel's locking in on the targets. And then they did three things. And this is where it gets iffy. I have to be honest, George, it's very early and there's incomplete information out there. But my understanding is that Iran used three types of ballistic missiles. One ballistic missile, uh, it's, it's a very clever missile. It, it, it uses a warhead that separates and then fires, burst fires, a bunch of decoys out there that appear to be specifically designed to absorb Iron Dome uh, missiles. So remember, the Iron Dome is tracking a target. You fire these, these, these decoy bursts, and so the Iron Dome says, aha, we have now 25 targets, and they fire 25 interceptors. Meanwhile, smaller warheads, maneuverable, burst through those interceptors and go down and hit the Israeli air defense systems. And that appears to be the case. I was looking at some video where you see this taking place, the shotgun effect of these bomblets, uh, the Iron Dome responding and then whoosh, coming in and they hit the air defense system. So they're showing the Israelis how we're going to take you out. The next thing that you see is they have these missiles coming in where you see the warhead separating from the, uh, from the missile body and then there's a booster engine on the warhead that drives it down into the ground at high speed, blowing away any radar intercept, any ability to intercept, hitting the target. And what this does is it clears the space. They clear air defense. And the final thing are these heavy warheads that come off of the heavy missiles that hit the runways and blew the big craters in them. This was a three-layered ballistic missile attack that was specifically designed by the Iranians to destroy Israeli air defense, to clear the way, to take out air defense, and then to show that we can put the big warheads on the target anywhere in Israel we want to. And this was successful. And the beauty of this is they didn't use their best missiles. All three, uh, with the exception, one, one of these missiles is rather new, but it's not the hypersonic missile. Israel didn't use their hypersonic missile. And Israel has lots of these missiles. This was just a single strike package. Iran has several strike packages just like this held in reserve that they have for Damona, that they have for the Kiria in Tel Aviv, that they have for other air bases. Um, Iran can repeat this process all day long. And what they showed Israel is, this is what we can do. And I can guarantee you there's people like me right now who wear uniform or intelligence officers doing the exact same analysis they're doing, and they're writing big critical reports up the chain of command saying, stop all nonsense, we can't win this war. It's over, guys. Stop it. We have no defense here. If Iran wants to come in, we are powerless. This thing will escalate out of control. Make it stop now, which is why Joe Biden was on the phone with the G7 to intervene with Israel, why Joe Biden was on the phone with Netanyahu, and why Netanyahu's generals were telling him, stand down. We can't win this fight. This is a huge Iranian victory. Yeah, we'll come to that latter point uh, in a minute. But do you agree with me that, as George W. Bush might put it, uh, they've all misunderestimated Iran all along. Well, again, the military hasn't. I, I, I have to say that I've worked with Israeli intelligence, with their technical intelligence people, with the people who do the analysis and the assessments of missiles. These are smart people. And 
if I sitting here thousands of miles away without any access to secret information would could have said I, I knew most of this going in before this happened, I knew what Iranian capabilities were, I can guarantee you they knew exactly what this was. But the problem is getting their voice heard by Israeli policymakers who are driven by emotion and by, by politics, domestic politics, etc. Um, what this attack did is empower their voices because now, whereas political leaders could say, well, you're just speculating, you don't know, that's just geeky intelligence stuff. Now they have the hard data. The photograph put on the table, the air defense guy saying, boss, we gave it our best shot. There was nothing we could do to stop them. The Americans calling up saying, there's nothing more we can do. We did everything. We can't stop this. Um, and now the Israeli politicians are waking up to the harsh reality that um, the fiction that they have been living uh, you know, living under um, is, is, is not even close to reality. It was a fantasy. And there's a real world out there, and it's a dangerous world. And they're going to have to change the way that they uh, operate. So let's move on to what happens next, Scott, if you will. Uh, it's said, and I, you've just said it, the media is saying it, I believe it, that Biden has uh, sought to dissuade. In what words and at what price, who knows, but sought to dissuade an Israeli response to Iran's response. Uh, for fear of this wider conflagration, for fear of a serious, 10 times more serious Iranian response to any Israeli response. Uh, but the question is, can Netanyahu survive without responding? Listening to Ben Gvir and others already this evening, uh, it seems to me that Netanyahu would fall uh, from power were he to go along with what Biden seems to be asking him to do. There's a couple of things that uh, I think we're going to see. Um, one, I think we're going to see Israel ratcheting up the pressure on Hezbollah. And now we're going to have to see, um, you know, the skills of um, Hassan Nasrallah and his ability to manage uh, this escalation ladder, which he's done so masterfully, but he, he, more more pressure is going to be put on Hezbollah by Israel, and Iran is going to be pressuring Nasrallah not to allow it to blow up, um, not to allow it to, um, you know, become the general war that Netanyahu so desperately needs. Uh, two, I think Netanyahu is going to call in the head of Mossad and sit the Bin Gavir down with him and say, "We're going to double down on our our covert war against Israel." You know, there. A lot of people have forgotten, but there was a there was a huge demonstration last year that became a civil war. I, I talked to senior Iranian officials about it, and they said this isn't demonstrations. This is a this is a hybrid war run by the CIA and Israeli Mossad designed to bring Iran down from within. And it's a it was a big problem. It was a big fight. Uh, the Iranians won; they prevailed. But I would see Israel um, encouraging uh, Baluch nationalist movements to strike. Um, Iran and Zahidan. I would see them encouraging ISIS to strike uh, in, in inside uh, Israel. I would s encourage them to see the Kurds striking, the Mujahideen al Khalq striking, all these external forces that the CIA, the British, and Israeli intelligence have been propping up for years. I think you're going to see the Israelis saying, you need to double down on this stuff. We need to put the pressure on Iran because we we can't be seen as doing nothing. We have to be seen as doing something. And this, again, will test the limits of Iran's deterrent policy. At what point in time will Iran expand it to say that the that hybrid attacks uh, using a proxy uh, qualifies as the same as a direct attack and our our deterrence will kick in as well? We're we dodged a bullet, but we're not out of the we're not out of the firefight yet. There's going to be a lot of um, there's going to be a lot of pressure put on down the road. The good news is Iran doesn't want to fight. They're not cowards. They prove that they will fight if need be. But Iran's focus is on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's on BRICS. It's on normalization of relations with Saudi Arabia. It's on economic prosperity. And a war with Israel will disrupt all of this. So the good news is there's a lot of patience built into Iran's foreign policy, um, a lot of flexibility. Um, and that that's necessary at this point in time because Iran has to understand that Israel has to do something for internal politics. And you either want a war or you don't. If you don't want a war, 
you're going to have to grit your teeth and bear it as Israel uses proxy forces to put pressure on Iran to punish Iran. Iran will have to absorb these attacks. But the other good news is Israel's losing the bigger war. Remember, the other thing Iran doesn't want to do is distract attention away from the fact that Hamas is winning, that Hamas has turned global opinion against Israel, that the world is now talking about a Palestinian state in ways that they had never done before. A larger war between Israel and Iran uh, d- you know, distracts people from that, that goal. And Iran doesn't want that. Iran understands that the axis of resistance together with Hamas was in the process of strategically defeating Israel, and that's the fight they want to fight. So I think Iran will be willing to absorb blows from Israeli proxies uh, in order to stay focused on the strategic victory that they're handling and not fall victim to the kind of you know, petty human narcissism that Israel falls victim to, where they say, oh, we've been slighted, we have to do massive revenge. Iran has shown itself to be a very patient, very resilient, very mature nation state when it comes to this sort of activity. Finally, Scott, and I'm grateful for your time as always. Uh, the English speaking king of Jordan, uh, uh, who, when he took the throne, literally could not speak Arabic and now speaks it with a rather splendid English accent, uh, he was the only Arab leader, if we can call him an Arab, call him a leader. Uh, who collaborated with Israel and the United States last night. Even their much more important and longer standing uh, allies declined uh, the opportunity to do that. Why did uh, King Abdullah do that? Uh, Has he not placed himself in very severe difficulty now with his own population, which is overwhelmingly Uh, opposed to Israel overwhelmingly in support of the Palestinians in Gaza. What what on earth forced King Abdullah to do that? Well, I call him the least Arab leader in the Arab world. As you pointed out, he, um, you know, his, his, his roots, his, his ideology, his mindset is very British. It's not, uh, it's not of the Arab street. He is so far removed from the reality of his people. Um, and he is so dependent upon Israel. And I put Israel first, then the United States and, and Europe for uh, his continued viability as a leader. Um, his betrayal of the Palestinian cause is, is, is apparent to all. And now his betrayal of the Arab world and indeed the Muslim world is on display Uh, Likewise, Um, he knows he's in a lot of trouble. The most dangerous thing in the world for the Hashemite king of Jordan is happening. And that is that the Palestinian people have a pathway to statehood. And a Palestinian state is perhaps the greatest threat to this artificial entity called the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Because he's not a Jordanian. He is a Saudi Arabian transplant. Um, And his, I believe, the... The, his, he may be the last Hashemite king of Jordan. That um, I don't wish upon him the fate of the last Hashemite king of Iraq, but I do believe that it's time for the king of Jordan to take his family and his retinue and fly off to London and live where he belongs among the British people he uh, he so adores, because he is reviled and hated amongst his own people and now amongst the entire Arab and Muslim world. He be, is a betrayer of the cause of the people of Palestine. So, World War Three or not, Scott, um, can we sleep in our beds tonight uh, with some confidence that the world will still be here when we wake up in the morning? I'd say in the short term, as long as Ben Gurion Airport is open and flights are coming in and out, go to bed, sleep well. Um, if if Ben Gurion shuts down then we need to start worrying about in what direction this is going because the Iranians aren't playing around anymore. And if Ben Gurion shuts down, it means the Israelis aren't taking um, no as an answer from the United States. And this thing could go in any direction. But for the moment, Ben Gurion's open. People are flying in and out. I'd say you can sleep well tonight. They're more flying out than in. Uh, Thank you, Scott Ritter, as always, for your wisdom your experience and your eloquence.